Welcome to NICU Heroes, a podcast produced exclusively for NICU professionals with me, Katherine Whitaker, as your host. I'm the mom of six children, including my very own NICU baby. This podcast is produced by Hand to Hold, a national nonprofit dedicated to providing free personalized support, resources, and community before, during, and after a baby's NICU stay. As a NICU professional, you've been well-trained to care for the tiniest and the sickest babies every day. While NICU parent scars are not as visible, NICU parents are often as fragile as their babies, requiring patience, guidance, and encouragement to ensure that they are mentally, emotionally, and physically prepared to endure the pressure of a NICU stay. NICU Heroes is dedicated to helping NICU professionals like you better understand, support, and nurture the entire NICU family. Howdy y'all, welcome back to the podcast. I'm really grateful that you're here. I hope that you enjoyed last month's episode with Dr. Katheria about best practices for preemies. I decided to switch gears just a little bit. There's still best practices, but I decided to invite a child life specialist to visit with us today because I really do believe that there is this great intersection of care between nursing and child life. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of baton passing. We're I have no doubt that Katie and I are going to talk a little bit about that, but I had interviewed Katie for our other podcast um, for NICU Moms, Dads, and Caregivers, and I loved our conversation so much that I was like, this woman has so much to offer the, uh, the NICU community and nursing in general about how we can be better advocates for babies and children who are undergoing difficult things, whether it be surgeries, procedures, transitions, whatever it may be. And I have no doubt that y'all are really, really going to love our conversation here. So my guest today is Katie Taylor. Katie is the co-founder and CEO of Child Life On Call, a digital platform designed to provide parents, kids, and the care team with access to child life services, tools, and resources. She's a certified child life specialist with over 12 years of experience working in various pediatric healthcare settings. Katie's the author of a children's book, and she has presented on the topics of child life and entrepreneurship, psychosocial care in the hospital, and supporting caregivers in the NICU setting, both nationally and internationally. Nationally. She's also the creator and the host of the Child Life On Call podcast, which focuses on the essential role of child life services to empower caregivers at and beyond the bedside. So with that, let's chat. Well, I'm excited to have Katie back. So if you follow our other podcast, you may have recognized her voice, but I'm really excited to have you here because this one is solely dedicated to helping NICU professionals be better NICU professionals. So I know that you have spent a lot of time with kids, some time in the NICU, and um, as well as just in the hospital in general. So I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So thanks for being here. Yeah, Catherine, thanks for having me back. I'm um, in love with all things NICU, hand to hold, and of course, just, you know, working with a multidisciplinary team. So really excited to be able to share some of the insight from child life perspective. Well, that's exactly what we're going to talk about. I think we should first start, though, with wild child life. I mean, I always think it's fascinating to hear from people as to why they pursue the particular career they did and why they have expertise that they do. So maybe walk us through a little bit about why you chose child life as a specialty. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was really fortunate to have two parents who like told me we're here to make the world a better place. And so um, whatever our job, our career, our role was, that kind of just was the focus. And not that it had to be, it just was the way that we were brought up. So my mom is a child abuse prevention advocate. Um, So my whole life, I grew up knowing about all different types of abuse, and I'm not emotionally scarred by that. I'm emotionally scarred by other things, but not by that. Um, And so just really listening um, to, you know, how to support families at their most vulnerable times. My dad has been in Medicaid managed care my whole life, and he always said that his role was to make sure everybody had access to health care. So um, without really kind of knowing that was going to set me on the trajectory of child life, I went to Penn State University, was actively involved in their uh, dance marathon called Thon, which is the largest student-run philanthropy in the world. Shout out Penn State. Their first year, they raised $2,000. They've now raised over $200 million. Um, So it's just, it's insane. It, it all goes to Hershey Medical Center. Um, but needless to say, um, just working alongside and supporting those families as a volunteer and a college student. And then I met a child life specialist. So actually, um, right after college, I spent some time doing community outreach for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and loved that role. Um 
got to work with law enforcement, attorney generals, but still it wasn't child life. And so that just stuck with me. So I went back to school, got more courses so that I could um, go through the training that it takes to be a child life specialist. That sounds like your parents were pretty incredible and in, in sort of maybe laying the groundwork. They, I mean, certainly didn't have a crystal ball to know what it is that you were going to do, but what a really foundational experience that must have been growing up in that household. And then also taking ownership of that when you moved into college and then into child life to say like, what's my role? What can I do? Right. I love that question. It's one of my favorites. Um, Ooh, yeah. So, um, so I know there are different roles of child life specialists. I know we have child life specialists who work in the hospital. So whether it's in the PDICU, the NICU, or just on the general floor, or maybe over in intermediate care. And then we also have child life who works in specialized doctor's offices. What's the, what's the role of those two experiences? Are they different? Are they the same? Kind of walk us through how they're similar, how they're different. Yeah, I think it kind of helps to know a little bit about what our background of study is and kind of where we put our focus to answer that question. So um, we're considered basically child development experts in psychosocial care. And so that can really be placed anywhere throughout the hospital or healthcare system. And um, the job looks different, right, in different places. So in an outpatient, just like a nursing, an outpatient looks different than a nursing in the ICU, but you're generally still doing your foundational skills. Um, so those two things really run together. Um, and then we also, you know, are expanding into hospice. Um, there's a, actually nine child life specialists in school districts across the country, which is a really low number, but really exciting. Um, some working in jails and um advocacy center. So starting to expand kind of what a psychosocial and family-centered care look like beyond the walls of the hospital. But yeah, specifically, um, you're right, we can work anywhere from an ICU to a med surge, outpatient radiology. Some uh, become more procedure-based, right? With If we have more outpatient experiences, whereas others may be more long-term or chronic care. If you think about being on a bone marrow transplant unit or in the NICU with families, um, we all cross cover each other all of the time. So I, I know when I had my baby, the nurse, like the float nurses would come from postpartum or all over the place, but kind of generally would stay there in the women's center. Um, whereas child life, I can literally be in the ER one moment and then, you know, helping with a port access on oncology the next. So we have to get really good at transferring our skills from one to the other. So that's why that foundation is just so important. You said a word there, and I want you to explain what it is. So you said psychosocial a couple of times. Mm. So maybe explain what psychosocial means. Yes, yes, great question. Sorry, that was my that was my Texas accent. Sorry, I should let you say it. No, well, I'm here in Austin, and so I I totally get it, and it's adorable, and I love it. And the more wine I have, the more my <laughs> accent comes out too. I understand. Um, <laughs> Psychosocial is really come from like developmental theorists like Eric Erickson and Piaget, and they talk about the impact of child development and how we interact with our world and what that does to basically our our growth and development. So we put those two things together and psychosocial safety, social emotional health, those are all really words looking at the whole health and well-being of the child, their mind, their spirit, um, and, and the whole family too. So we take some of those psychosocial considerations um, that we know based off a child's development and then apply them to the healthcare setting. Okay. That's good. Thank you. I know yeah. that sometimes we hear words and we're like, what does that mean? Is that, oh, you're that right. Awesome. You're absolutely right. And I can get way too like, you know, it's an interesting as a child life specialist. We try sometimes so hard to not just be the play lady that sometimes we just go like straight into theory and people are like, wait, you lost me. <laughs> like th I thought you blew bubble bubbles. We you know? were just playing hungry, hungry yeah. hippos. What happened? <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, well, speaking of child life, so um, how does child life differ from nurse? So if you're in that role of nursing or child life, what's the biggest differ differentiator between the two? Yeah, I would say that we are not trained um, medically, right? You have kind of this biology and medical background as nurses, and that's something that we don't have, but we learn clinically on the job. Um, and we co really come from a foundation of child development, family-centered care, psychosocial care, um, and then we learn clinically along, along the way. So um, 
you nurses are absolutely the the experts when it comes to anything medical and what we learn, we learn on the job, which is kind of a different scenario. Um, it What's really great about it, though, is it allows me to learn in a way that a family would learn and experience. And that's where I took away, especially in my internship and clinical training. So to become a certified child life specialist, you have to have that clinical on the job training, which we do for 600 hours um, unpaid uh, called an internship. And then we can go sit for our certifying exam. So we're really learning on the job. What is this hospital medical experience that's happening? Um, And I think what's really cool about the career in child life is you can kind of get as geeky and nerdy and medical as you want to. Um, And that's something I never pictured myself doing. I never pictured myself being medical in the hospital. I always pictured myself helping kids and families. Um, So for me, getting to learn this whole new world of medicine has just been so amazing. I ended up meeting my husband, who's a nurse anesthetist, and our brains could not be more different in the way that we... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that we communicate and we think wow. about work. Uh, we actually met working in an OR together. Um, and so, you know, we just, we function very differently at work, but what's beautiful is one definitely needs the other, right? And mm-hmm. in those moments of that science and clinical based, having that person or that team member that can come in and, and give you the psychosocial base and vice versa, right? Us relying on nurses and saying, what is possible? What is not possible? And then us bringing in this background of development and what we know about kids and families to really provide this beautiful blended approach is really like the magic and my favorite thing about child life is learning from nurses, learning from the medical care team, and getting to offer some insight about what we know that kids and families experience based on their psychosocial or their mental emotional health. Well, I remember many times that there would be a moment that I would turn to the nurse and I would be like, I need someone to explain this. And then there would be times that the child life specialist would be in the room and I'm like, I just need someone to see me and my kid for just a moment. Not yeah. that the nurse wasn't, but they, like you said, they offered, they had a different skill set and it was really complimentary. But I found as the mom that I was gravitating towards one or the other, depending upon the situation that we were in. But deeply grateful for both. We had child life in both situations um, and many of the hospital stays that we had. So really grateful. So you mentioned family-centered care. So do you find, Katie, that in family-centered care that it's easier to do your job as a child life specialist? Maybe is it more challenging to do it in a different scenario? Like, I guess, how has the sort of this emergence of family-centered care changed child life and how you serve patients? Yeah, in our training, we family system is at the heart of what we do. And so for me, there is no other type of care. Um, it's just the lens, the perspective I have. Um, the patient is not your patient. Like the whole entire family is your patient. And I've learned that from nurses too. And, you know, they really just work so well with families. But that's the lens and perspective that child life has is that this is like a trickle down effect because we know if mom hasn't had her coffee or there is some other brother or sister to pick up at school or this is so important for this family because of X, Y, Z or grandparents usually live in the home, but they don't. So our lens is just so family centered. Um, And I think that's a gift to be able to come into the hospital with and especially when you have a organization that you work for that really prioritizes family-centered care, sometimes it can get a little tricky with those policies or protocols that say, you know, parents have to spend the night at the bedside. Well, what if they're a single parent and there's no one else to watch the child at home, but the sibling can't come spend the night. So that's where we get really, we prefer that gray area of every situation is unique. We have to come at it from uh, the perspective of a family, what the medical and hospital needs are and how can we put those two together? So for us, that's really that family-centered care lens is is how is this affecting everything within the system, not just the family, but the medical team too. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think that child life specialists 
sort of a little bit of detective work as you come in, you have to figure out um, what are the family's pain points, what is working well, what's not working well, mm -hmm. and then how can how can we step into that? So I'm going to throw a few scenarios at you because I know that sometimes nurses may or may not be in the room when some of those things, or, or certainly they're experiencing them and they're like, oh, do I call child life specialists to, you know, specialists to come in? So how do we do that? So yeah. this sort of feels like the rapid fire, but you don't have to answer quick. <laughs> okay. So some, and, and, and I, and I guess I should say, maybe let's, um, depending upon the scenario, it might, we might focus a little bit more on how you might navigate that with a baby or an infant versus sure. a toddler or a child who can probably communicate a little bit differently. So some strategies that you might employ if you have a child who is having um, a lot of anxiety about a surgery. Mm. So I know that we have I know as, as, as infants, my son didn't necessarily have anxiety about surgery. I did that for him. But as he got older, you know, toddler years and a little bit older as babies, and he started to realize like, oh, these sounds and sights look familiar. And when we walk down this hallway, I know what's about to happen. And then yeah. we would start to see, and that was a lot. So what would be some things as a child life specialist that you would employ to help that child maybe go into surgery a, a little bit less anxious? Yeah, great question. So, yeah, I think you're you hit the nail on the head that right when we think about preparing a child for surgery or a patient and family for surgery, um we tend to think about those older kids who are able to talk, but what we know is based on development, infants can have stressors just like preschools and pre preschoolers, toddlers, school agers and adolescents. And so the first thing we do and I'll probably say this in all of the scenarios that you say is this really like kind of developmental assessment and family assessment of if we know an infant stressor, the four infant stressors are um, a harsh environment, um, pain could be a stressor, uh, being taken away from their primary caregiver, um, then what are the things that we can do to counteract those stressors in this environment? So when it comes to surgery, it's literally keeping the infant in the parent's arms for as long as possible, maybe even why the versetta is being given or whatever. So we limit the amount of time that that stressor can really cause a lot of stress for the infant and for the family. Um, the last part of infant stress is that parental anxiety. So what are we doing around the parent to help them feel supported so that it doesn't get passed on to the infant? As we moved on to like toddler and preschoolers, I think what you're going to see there for kids, especially before going back to surgery, which can be stressful, is that moment of separation from caregivers. We can't predict what the anesthesia team is going to deem in terms of a parent coming with them into surgery for the induction or not going into surgery for the induction. So um this is this is one of my favorite things to talk about is preparing kids for surgery is really about preparing the parent and preparing the parent that there will be separation. And so what are yeah. we going to do to both equip you for that moment of separation so that you know what to expect or for the child? Um, and so through that, we do a lot of preparation, a lot of what we call role play. Uh, you can hear it like role rehearsal or role reversal. So that's where I talk to the stuffed animal and I play the role of the doctor and I tell the stuffed animal what's happening or vice versa. I pretend that the stuffed animal is the doctor and I am the patient. Um, and so just a bunch of different ways that we really integrate play, which is exactly how children learn. Um, and start to prepare them for what the sequence of events is going to be like, what the sensory experiences are going to be like, what is it going to look like, who are you going to see, what is it going to smell like. Um, in the case of surgery, we know that kids typically 10 years and under, unless they're already in the hospital, um, will go to sleep breathing in their mask. And that's really just due to the amount of nitrous oxide that they breathe in um, or sevoflurane ahead of time. And so our main goal is to prepare that family for what breathing in in an operating room is going to be like. Um, so we'll work with that play. We'll use pictures ahead of time. Um, often when I'm using pictures of the operating room, I show the child familiar objects. They're looking at a picture of an operating room going, I'm going in there. But what I do is I say, do you see the bed in there? 
Do you see a bed? Do you have a bed at your house? You do? Okay. Yeah. Do you have a sink at your house? They have it. There's a green balloon in there. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking these, this really strange looking picture of a place I'm going to have to go to, but I'm trying to get the child to see that although it looks different, I'm actually familiar with some of the things in here. Um, this is an important step. And one of my favorite stories to tell is I was preparing a child to go back to surgery. I was preparing them with the picture, showing them exactly what to look like. There's the two lights that come down, sometimes more than two, but those two big lights that come down right on top of the operating room table. And if you can imagine, you know, those look really weird. They don't look like normal lights. So I was asking the child, you know, what do you think these are? I love asking that question because you get an insight into how they're going to respond. And just very matter of factly, he was like, well, those are the daggers they're going to shoot inside my body. And I'm like, boy, am I glad I asked that question because those are just lights, buddy. You know, but how terrifying to be a five-year-old rolling into surgery being like, and there are the daggers. But because we talked about it ahead of time. Um, we talk about how they're actually just lights, like when you go to the dentist or they kind of look like a sunshine or maybe a pair of sunglasses. Um, but that's why always giving the option to prepare is good because kids will come up with their own reasons for things. Sure. And sometimes they can be terrifying reasons that you would never dream of, like dagger wow. shooting inside my body. But if we talk about it ahead of time, they actually just become lights. So preparation is huge. Um, You're not always going to have child life there. You're not always going to know exactly how the right thing to do or say, but we can break information down, make it really calm, not complex, but um, really simple, concrete, so that the child understands what's going to happen. Yeah, I I love asking kids questions. You're right, because sometimes their responses one surprise you, but also you're like, oh, well, that's something that we that's that's an easy explanation as to what what that is, what that is, and what that isn't. I know that for us, it was the separation part because our son knew exactly the moment that I handed them, you know, over to the nurse that that was it. And so, yeah. for said was our friend, and yeah. and and we learned how far can I go. How far will the doctor and the nurse anesthetist let me go before, totally. you know, you know, we get him relaxed enough that, and I feel good too, because there's nothing worse I know as a parent than giving your child over and they are mm. losing everything that they have because this feels scary to them. I think that your point about that moment of separation is so important. Maybe the most critical thing to prepare for. Because it can be so easy to say, this is going to be the hardest moment. I don't want to tell them they're going to have to get separated, you know, because that is just going to make them more scared. But what will be more traumatic is that moment of like being either tricked Mm -hmm. or, you know, ripped away. So we go as far as to say we would put a stop sign by the time, like when we get to the stop sign, that's the visual cue that you're going to hug mom and dad and say, see you later. Um, and also in the interest of just being kind of a, an advocate in this scenario, because I've seen it work well so many times is opening up to the idea that we don't have to say black and white parents can't go back, but making it a conversation like with you, Catherine, for example, you're a mom who has been in the medical field, knows what to expect, has kids, has been through a NICU stay. And so I would look to you and say, what? you know, what does feel good? Does separating and not going back feel okay because you know it's just going to be too emotionally hard for you to watch them fall asleep? Or do you feel like if I prepare you for exactly what to expect, you might be able to be there as your son falls asleep? And I go as far as to say, you know, we can get parents back there and then my role no longer becomes supporting the child as they fall asleep. I'm supporting the parent as they support their child falling asleep. But it's okay to have these conversations and start to advocate and say, well, why have we always done it this way? If we have parents come back, they know their role, they know when to walk out, they know what it's going to look like, and they're on board, that could be another option. Can we clone you, Katie, so that you are everyone's (laughs) child loss specialist? You're so good. Um, Oh, gosh. Yeah, you took me back to a few... um, a few hospital stays. Our son had seven surgeries, which is why that was a an important question for me to ask because I know that many nurses are walking with patients. You know, obviously the first time we did surgery, it was our first time. Um, not our first surgery with a kid, but obviously the first one to be so acute. And uh, and I needed 
I needed someone to walk us through that. Mm-hmm. So thank you for that really good and thoughtful yeah. response. All right. So difficult procedure. So it might be, Katie, like helping um, a child navigate or sort of understand a difficult procedure. And, and I'm and I'm primarily thinking of a procedure that they're alert and awake for. You know, maybe it's a blood draw. You know, maybe it's, you know, they're doing a catheter. So they're awake for it. They may have some local anesthetic, but for the most part, they are very aware of what's going on, which sometimes I think is more scary than going into surgery. But yes. so a child is walking in or a baby's walking into a difficult procedure. Probably the babies, you're doing more supporting for the parents as they get older, more supporting for the for the child, but what would be some things that you would do to help that child sort of navigate that difficult procedure a little bit easier? Yeah, uh, this is such a good question. I think it may help if we take a procedure and just try to, if I walk you through what I would do for that. Um, Without a doubt, my least favorite procedure is what's called the VCUG, which is avoiding Mm -hmm. cystourethrogram. It happens in radiology, typically with kids between two, five, and six. And we have to have them lay down on a fluoroscopy table, have a catheter inserted while they're awake, fill their bladder to the point of being full, ask them to rotate on their sides and then Mm -hmm. pee on themselves. Okay. Like, could they, I say this to adults and they're like, they may, like adults can't even imagine this. Happening We've done that them. one. Yeah. It's I, I'm walking right through there with you. Yes. <laughs> so yes, it is horrible. I mean, it's the worst mm-hmm. and we need active participation, not just from the patient, but from the parent because they are their child's person. So we do a lot of preparation there. I, I have a, a doll. I will have the, um, the explanation of why do we need to do this? We need to take pictures of your bladder inside your body. Your bladder is like a balloon. It fills up with water. Do you know that feeling when you have to go pee pee? So again, just trying to relate to the child about what their experience is going to be like and why. And they place the catheter um, in the doll. We put a piece of tape on it. We talk about the brown soap called betadine. I mean, if the child is willing and participating, we will use that opportunity to prepare them so that when they are laying down on that table, they go, okay, this is the brown soap they told me about. Okay, this is when I need to blow out like I'm blowing out a pinwheel. Um, this is when the catheter comes on. This is when the tape goes on because tape has to come off. So uh, you're going to hear me talk about assessment, right? So how is the child engaging in this preparation with me? Um are they actively participating or uh, do they not want to participate in preparation? The third thing is control because they are being forced to do so many things that they don't want to do, but we need their buy-in. So we need kids to have control over this scenario. And it can be as simple as, do you want me to hold the iPad here or do you want me to hold the iPad here? right? Or do you want to count to three when it's time for the catheter to go in? These are small choices that can make a big impact because it gives the child some say in how this goes. Um, The other thing I, I want to talk about in painful procedures or complex procedures is that it can be really uncomfortable for adults, myself included, child life specialists, parents, nurses, to watch kids in pain and to watch them get upset and kick and cry. But doesn't it make a lot of sense that they're reacting this way? It makes a ton of sense that a child would protest a catheter. I mean, it just does. And so when you take that the uncomfortableness for you of a child feeling that way, you can then start to relate and validate and say, this is not fun. This is not easy. You're right, this does not feel okay. Um, often we can say things like, it's okay. You're fine. It's almost done. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine, but it's not fine for this child. And Mm -hmm. so really just getting with them, being with them in those moments of this is scary, but you're not alone. We're here to help you through it can be incredibly powerful. I'm actually really glad that you said the, the fine comment. I think I, as an adult, hate it when people say it's all going to be fine. And I want to scream at them and say, but it's not (laughs) fine right now. Like, I, as an adult, I know what it's going to be like on the other side. But I think really looking at it from a perspective of a kid and saying, like, this is really hard. And I'm really proud of of how you're doing this or or mm-hmm. whatever it is. Like I'm thinking of my kids going through difficult procedures is that I think I started out, Katie, saying it's all going to be fine. And instead, I started to switch to this is really hard. And yeah. if, you know, 
and, and, you know, yeah, we would prepare them. Yes, we would talk about them. But I stopped saying it's fine because I learned that from a child life specialist because while it feels like the natural thing to say, it is the worst possible thing because I think my kids started to feel like, but don't you see, like, right. clearly screaming I mean, you, or whatever, this alone. hurts. And, and I, I've been, even found my, it's like you're willing it to be fine. You're like, it's fine. Yes. It's fine. And, <laughs> but it's not. Be fine. But what yeah. we want is for our words as the adults in the room to match the child's experience. So yes. when our words are something different than what the child's experiencing, then they're saying, wait, is this fine? You know, is, should I, you know, am I feeling this wrong? Because they're all mm-hmm. acting like this is fine, but it's not. So mm-hmm. the more that we can, um, you know, validate and believe and respect and sit in it with them. I mean, the the more success they're going to have in trusting healthcare providers long term. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And I think that does go back to trust is that if you want them to trust you for the next procedure and the next procedure, if they know that, yeah, it's going to be uncomfortable, but at least I know they're going to tell me what's going to happen and they're going to validate how I feel, then maybe I can walk into it knowing that I don't feel lied to, like I know what's coming. So Mm -hmm. I think that it does a couple of things, validation, but also trust, which I think are really important. All right. So we talked a little bit about pain. (laughs) Yeah. which often accompanies either a surgery or a procedure. But how do you help kids manage? Because sometimes a kid, like you may not think that that's painful to them or to mm-hmm. that baby. And then their reaction, either an elevated heart rate or, you know, vocal sounds that they make or whatever tells you, oh, this is painful and we didn't expect it to be painful. How do you help a kid um, manage pain that either you expect them to have or that when the procedure starts, then you realize, oh, that's more painful than we thought. Or sometimes maybe it's not supposed to be painful and it is. And then that's your cue to be like, hey, I think we poked something like we did something wrong here. Let's fix it. So how do you help a kid um, manage really difficult pain? Yeah. I think it's an ongoing assessment of constantly checking in and saying, is this working? Is this not working? Um, We usually as child life specialists do the assessment, but then we pull in what we call like our bag of tricks is just available at any moment because something may work for a little bit and then start to not work, right? Um, It may work that at first we decided not to watch the painful thing, but in fact, that's creating more anxiety because you don't know what's happening. And actually looking at the thing is going to help that child through it more. Um, And so sometimes the plan changes. I think um, keeping those non-pharmaceutical things present, if there is no way to negate the painful experience, if we don't have, you know, I work a lot with the Meg Foundation for Pain, which is an amazing resource. So I highly recommend going to work with them. And there is no proof to like, you have to tough it out in order to like grow stronger. That is just not a real thing. We do not need kids to feel pain so that they don't grow up and be like, quote unquote, pansies. They don't have to feel pain and they can still grow up and mature in the way they need to. And in fact, more pain and exposure to more heightened pain and prolonged pain, even in the NICU, can really um, make then more pleasurable experiences feel painful because their receptors are all thrown off. So actually managing pain from a pharmaceutical, not multidisciplinary level is so important from the beginning. So in whether it's in the ER or in the NICU, if there's going to be any kind of skin breaking, we talk about numbing cream. There's just no reason not to talk to the doctor and say, is this a possibility? Um, And sometimes we'll say, well, we don't know exactly where we're going to poke. And well, let's put it on three different places that we may poke. It's okay. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Here's an idea. Yeah. You know, but then for a nine month old, the act of actually putting on numbing cream with a tegaderm on top may be worse than a poke. So you are having to assess like, what is the risk benefit of this? So after we've done all of the pharmacological things that we need to from a multidisciplinary lens, some of the things we can do from a child life lens or a family perspective lens is keeping the caregivers close, offering choice and control, saying it's okay to take breaks, that this is hard. I think sometimes we want to get it done fast, and so we will prolong it, but that doesn't give the child a chance to recover and then rebuild trust with you. 
So I had, um, I have a really close friend who's a PDER doc and she sends me a text and she's like, okay, I have to do two pokes on a kid, two painful things. Do I do them at the same time or one at a time? And my response is, well, did you ask the child (laughs) what they wanted? And she said, she said, neither. (laughs) I said, that's amazing. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Okay. So then we have to talk about how do we ask questions? You know, we have to say, now you have two choices. The choice is, do you want one at a time or would you like to have them both at a time? And we have to decide one of them. Um, So we have to talk about giving real choices where they're due. But uh, often what we find is that when kids are able to go through something painful, see they can get through it, they can then get through something else too. So it's looking at what is best. What is this child telling you? What is the insight from the parent telling you? They've been through painful things before with their kids. So you can look at this amazing resource in the room and saying, what's your input? You know, what do you think based on past experiences? Should we do two at the same time or one at a time? But really just looking at like holistically, what does the family say? Um, Often for kids in pain, uh, diversion or an alternative focus or distraction can work well. I see this work really well for toddlers, preschoolers, school agers. It can be as simple as us watching a Minecraft video together. Um, sometimes it's you know the opposite of distraction, and it's actually mindfulness, and it's breathing and counting and watching and engaging. So that assessment is happening at all the different times, um, and that's really why having a child life specialist in the room can be really beneficial because they're able to pull from all of these different things that do work well. So when pain happens, if it's inevitable, we know how to counteract it. I think because uh, I just saw my preemie walk by. Um, yeah, as we had the child life specialist, his big thing was blood draws. We do them often and they are no one likes a blood draw. No one signs up for that. And it's like, these are amazing. Mm-hmm. We should do these. Except if you're a phlebotomist, then you like yeah. them, I guess. But <laughs> but um but yeah, it became the sort of like, do we try this? Oh, that didn't work. Do we try this? Do we try that? And it was, of course, it was the last thing that we tried. And it was the distraction part. Um, so he knew that it was coming. But but we were also letting him grow up. You know, this is over a period of years. And so how you respond to pain or something that you have to do on a regular basis changes as you get older. And maybe something mm-hmm. that didn't work now now does, or you now no longer need that because now you've figured out how to okay, we're going to take a deep breath and this is going to be uncomfortable, but we can do this. So it reminded me, I was watching him walk by thinking how far we've come and all of that. But yeah, uh, managing pain, I think is a, it can be really, really stressful, not only for the child life specialist, but for really everyone as you try to, because you know, I mean, the reality is, is that you're doing that procedure because you need an answer or because it's going to fit a piece of a puzzle. So, you know, you know what the end game is. But it can be really traumatic and really scarring. And, you know, it becomes this trigger and it can, it could be an ongoing thing that continues to provide, like re-traumatizes them every time. So figuring out what works, I think, uh, of all the scenarios that we talk about, I actually think that's the one because we all encounter pain for medical procedures at some point in our life. And some of our kids endure that a lot earlier and a lot more often than we do as adults. Yeah. And it's to your point, it's almost sometimes the fear of pain that yeah. tends to be the the thing that's the most scared. So like in the scenario, I don't, you know, know your son or anything, but, or how old he is, but you could say the next time we have to have one of these done, like, when do you want to know about it? Do you want to know about it right before we have to leave? Or do you want a week to prepare? Um, as kids get older, they can start to give you insight about their preferences for things. And I always think that follow-up conversation to after something painful and say, this seemed like it went well, or this seemed like it didn't go well. Like, what should we change for next time? So that you have kind of that game plan for the next time something painful has to happen. And then the child gets more of a choice in in what's going on. But yeah, it's, there's, it's not easy. It's just not easy. (laughs) <laughs> it's well, I know, I know, I know. I've been throwing a bunch of scenarios at you for um, the child that's in the NICU, but I want to switch yeah. gears a little bit, and I want to talk about their siblings. Mm. So sometimes, sort of, the silent sufferers that the siblings are watching their um, either baby brother or baby sister, um, or maybe if they're a little bit older, but they're watching them endure things, and maybe they're not fully understanding what's going on. As a child loss specialist, Katie, what are some things that you do to help siblings of chronically ill or acutely ill children understand what's going on with someone that they love? 
Yeah, I I prepare them just like I'm preparing the actual patient for what's going to happen. Because just like in that scenario where the child was thinking there were daggers shooting inside their body, the sibling can be thinking those are daggers shooting inside my sibling's body, but actually they're just lights. So um, we would actually do family preparation sometimes if the family was around, if there was going to be a port placement, if there was going to be... um, you know, even PT and OT can sometimes look painful to siblings as they're watching their brother or sister go through it. So it's that run to what the most honest, concise, simple answer is and tell the sibling that and keep them feeling included. Um, let them have hands-on preparation. Um, ask to bring some extra nursing supplies home to share with the sibling. One of the things I did when I worked in the NICU were sibling bags, and every single one of them had like a welcome to the sibling book, welcome to the NICU book. Um, these are questions that you can, a sheet of paper for you to write questions for the doctor, right? Just as if they were their own doctor. Um, It was funny. In one of these bags, we actually sent home a dinosaur as like a stuffed animal. But the sibling was like, oh, this is Dr. Dinosaur. And so every letter was written Dr. Dinosaur. And every time they would meet a NICU doctor, it was Dr. Dinosaur. And for the parents, it was like such a welcome little like lovely thing that the sibling just connected to. And they would hug Dr. Dinosaur at night when they missed brother or sister. So you know, the siblings should be included as if they are the patient, as if they can have enough choices. Do they like to know when brother or sister is coming through something? Do they not like to know? Um, but just integrating them as if they are a part of the family because they are. Um, and also, I think taking the weight off the parents to have to get it right all the time. Um, there are going to be, I think, seasons of the sibling feeling really engaged. And then there's going to be seasons where the sibling is feeling left out. And that's just kind of a normal cycle of having a a brother or sister with a chronic healthcare condition. Um, So just, you know, reassuring the family, like this is normal. Here are some things we can do. Um, Here are some things you can consider. Uh, How can we get them involved, but it doesn't create more work for the parents. Um, I don't know. I hope that helps answer your question a little bit. I think I got all over the place. No, it it absolutely does because, you know, there are certainly strategies that you use for the particular patient, but siblings see all that happen too. And while they may not feel the physical pain or may may not have to undergo the procedure, they certainly have to be in the house with the caregivers or the parents who are navigating through all that. And then also, you know, if it's, if it's a surgery or procedure and that child is recovering at home, you know, they play a role in that. I know my, um, our preemie was our fifth baby. So I had four other children at home and they were certainly very aware, um, some more than others. And then of course we discovered later on the extent of what all that meant to them and how that affected them. So I think that they are an important population that sometimes we don't talk often enough about. Um, You know, what are some suggestions? I know that there are opportunities for you as a child life specialist, Katie, to be with working with other NICU professionals. What do you think um, are some good strategies or some good things to consider when, when you want to be a good team as a child life specialist with the rest of the medical team that's serving that baby and that family? Yeah, I think the like the way I put it is just like that magic teamwork of knowing each other's strengths and knowing where you can feel supported um, in an area. So because we don't come in always with this clinical training, I rely so heavily on nurses to help me understand what in the world is going on or what side effects from a medication may be. And then I perhaps can interpret that for them. Um, on how a family can perceive the way they say something. So um, a scenario I have is when uh, the mom walks in and the first thing the nurse says is, hey, mom, what milk do you have for me today? And the the purpose there is like, hey, you are breastfeeding. That's amazing. You're making milk. But perhaps the mom didn't get as much milk as she wanted. Or perhaps the that's a different mom than they thought and they're actually not breastfeeding at all. Or perhaps they left the milk at home. So um, another way to address that could be like, hey, mom, how did you sleep last night? You know, what did you bring along with you today? And so you're like opening up a conversation. You're asking how much milk did they have, right? Because you can see they're holding something in their hands, but it, it just changes the question a little bit to reflect how might the parent interpret what I'm asking? Um, 
and vice versa. I explain things wrong. <laughs> you know, sometimes and I the nurse comes and is like, not quite, Katie. We actually can't do that. And I'm like, okay, noted. Um, but wow. it really is, it's nice having different perspectives and different lenses look at things all for the betterment of the family. So, I mean, I just was privileged to work in a NICU where my phone rang off the hook. And this was in a position that had never had child life before. So I was wondering, am I going to be used? Are they going to want me? How am I going to be included? And then, you know, we got to the point where we're all just nonstop trying to help as many families as possible. And then the nurses are coming up with ideas and they're telling me, hey, this is what the nursery looks like at home. Is there something we can do to make this room feel more like the family? Or this dad is a police officer. Wouldn't it be cute if we could do like a footprint that looks like a, you know, police car. And so it's just that beautiful marriage between professionals working together and in, in hope of the family. So I, I love when the the team can work together. No, it makes a difference. It certainly makes for a little bit less anxiety, I think, on on the family side. But but also when you have a team that like looks at the kid and they're like, okay, let's see how we can um, mm. make this situation better than when we walked in the door. Um, so Katie, you were talking a little bit about the roles of like nurses versus doctors versus specialists. So how do you know, or how does a nurse know, okay, so this is a child life issue, or this is like a psychologist, a specialist, a nurse issue? Like, how do you know when it's, when it moves from something that you're doing in child life or from a nursing standpoint, how do I know when it's a nursing thing? And then when does it move out of my, my specialty, my expertise? And when do I need to ask somebody else? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I always move to, in my scenarios, where if a nurse is to tell me, oh, I didn't need you for this procedure, I immediately go to, well, I would have loved to make that assessment myself and decide that that was a role that I didn't need. And maybe I didn't need to be there. Um, But it's when I think we close the door to just saying, oh, this probably isn't to this definitely isn't, or why don't I just ask and then get their involvement? Um, And if it moves out of scope for a child life specialist, say it's better handled by a social worker or or a therapist or a psychologist, we do the same thing and say, you know, this is, this feels out of our scope. Let's ask them what their input is. And so allowing them to be the deciders of when it is or is not kind of their role to play. Um, I think, you know, some of, to just kind of answer the question, any nurse can learn psychosocial and family-centered care and just be able to offer incredible sibling support. And so I would never want to say, no, that's only my job. You can't do a sibling visit, right? That's the child life specialist job. Oh my gosh, how am they're going to, this family is going to tell the story forever about this nurse who made this visit possible. And I don't ever want to be in the way of that because it should be a child life thing. So I think When egos go aside and you open the conversation to, is this something you want to be a part of or something you can help with? That's always going to lead to a more productive outcome. Yeah, no, that's a good, that's a good reminder because I'm sure as, as y'all are operating and working in the same space, just like you may not be necessarily medically trained, but you start to see like when a nurse does X, Y, and Z with a patient, their response is this because you've seen it clinically happen in front of you. So maybe not the medical part, but you see the clinical side and then vice versa on their side that they're like, oh, the last time child life came in, they did this and maybe you're busy. Maybe you can't do that. And they're like, well, let's try this and see how it happens. So I think instead of this territorial part, but like, how do we really work together? And then knowing too, like, hey, child life is here. Let's employ them. Let's get them here because I have these other three patients that I need to serve in a different way. And so now we're going to pass that over. I know that they are, depending upon the, the critical nature of the patient, they may only have a couple of patients, they may have a vast, you know, feels like probably half the floor. Um, so sometimes everybody's time is not, you know, in abundance and you're trying to do a lot with just a little. So that's a good reminder of that. Yeah. I was just talking with another NICU child life specialist the other day, and she was talking about how she, the family, the parents had to move back to their home country, leaving the baby, um, alone in the NICU. And so, her and the nurse were talking like, how can we help this family feel integrated? So they came up with a plan that um, every so often the child life specialist would do a FaceTime, you know, with the baby and the mom would read a book and sometimes the nurse would do it. And that's just such a beautiful collaboration of like both 
people looking out for the entire family. And it doesn't mean that it's not nursing or it's not child life, but it's both. Right. No, I think that there's a really a, a really beautiful opportunity for there to be integration of all of that so that so that to the patient, it just seems like you have all these people that sort of blend from one to the next and you start to see your your care really integrated as opposed to this specific person comes in and then this one comes in. Yes. And then this one comes in, but but that it's a nice handoff, like, okay, yes. now it's your turn, now it's your turn, whatever it may be. Um, what do you think, Katie, or some like across the board? common stressors among families as they walk into a hospital setting, whether it be in the NICU or the PICU, and they're experiencing a stay, like what what do you see kind of generally speaking, common things that people carry with them as stressors? Yeah, I think my my answer has changed from this, you know, I think from the beginning of my career and in, into now. And I think the balance of living in two different worlds just causes an insane amount of exhaustion that can be really hard to overcome. Like you're literally transitioning from one world to the other when you're walking in and out of the hospital, but both worlds are still going on. And so just living in two different places mentally is, is exhausting. Um, I think the stressors that we see too are the need to feel like you have to constantly advocate amongst people who are professionals and should know how to take care of your child. So, you know, you're at the bedside all the time, not that you don't want to take a break or need a mental break, but you feel like, well, what if something comes by and this person doesn't know my child like I do? And that advocacy can feel both draining, but we can also reframe it to have it feel really empowering um, if the family is well supported. So like, you know, your baby best, like let's write down everything, you know, so that when you do leave, right, we can leave this like little about me poster for this baby or this child so that if somebody does come by, they know the way they like to be rocked. They know this or that. Um, so those are two of the biggest stressors I see with families who have long-term kind of complex families in the hospitals. That This has also then, you know, we've got home life, work life, siblings, um, families inundating with questions about how are things going? And then you're having to like relive your experience over and over, sometimes not wanting to share exactly what's going on. Um, and then the last thing, I think the biggest stressor is just this, the stressor of feeling isolated that no one else really gets or understands what I'm going through. Sometimes not even your, your partner, um, if you have one. So those are the stressors I see in families. Yeah, I can definitely confirm that the living in two worlds simultaneously, that they both continue to, to exist at the same time. Uh, when our son was in the NICU, he w- he didn't continue to not be in the NICU. He was always there. And my other kids yeah. were continuing to live at home. But yet, I felt like I was stepping into two very different worlds at the same time. And I know that um, our nurses were a big help in helping us be present, like be here at the hospital and do what you can do here and then take a deep breath and then go home and do what you can do there. But that is a lot easier to say than it is to do. So yeah. um, probably the the source of many, many points of stressors for us. I'm glad that you mentioned that. Um, so you talked a little bit about like tools in your tool belt, Katie. So when a child life specialist is either not available or or not at the hospital um, and maybe either with another patient or you simply just don't have an abundance of child life specialists where you work, what are some good like how to like tools in the tool belt that a nurse should have if a child life specialist is not there, but yet they still want to serve that patient? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I would say something called a coping plan. A coping plan is a way for the family and the patient to be in the driver's seat or at best the passenger seat um, of what's happening during something, whether it be a procedure or PT or OT or surgery. But it gives them an opportunity to express choices and control over a situation that they normally wouldn't have any. So when I say coping plan, um, we usually look at three different things. The first thing is, what do I want the environment to be like during this time, during, let's say, procedure is what we're talking about. I want the lights to be low. I want there to be as few people as possible. Um, I want to have my blankets on me and I want my dad in my chair next to me. Like, so that's the environment that I'm choosing for this procedure that I don't have a choice over. The second thing of the coping plan is what can I do during the coping plan to help me get through it or during the procedure to help me get through it? 
Can I look at a book? Can I watch an iPad? Can I count to 10? Can I listen to my favorite song? Um, can I watch a movie? Can I watch what's happening? So they're able to have coping skills that they're implementing during the procedure. And then the last part of the coping plan is just ensuring that the patient knows when it's over. So sometimes we can say like, it's over, it's over, but actually the bandaid hasn't been pulled off yet. (laughs) So for that child, let me tell you, the procedure is not not over. over. (laughs) It's not over until I see your butt walking out the door. Right. And so it's just like confirming the tape, like the, the removal of adhesive. Mm. Nothing is over until that's done. Nothing is (laughs) over. So brutal. Yeah. Um, like, and it's thrown away and I can't see it anymore. Right. So, um, and then how do I know when it's over? And then what do I want to be asked when it's over? Do I want to be asked, what do I want to do afterward? Do I want to be asked, who do I want in the room after? Do I want to choose an activity? Can I get up and take a walk around the unit? Um, so putting that coping plan together is going to be your best tool. And this can be verbal. Um, we have a free one that you can use, but there's just so many things that you can talk about with a family, write it down on a piece of printer paper and say, this is what I want the environment to look like. This is what I want to do during the procedure. This is when I know it's over and what I want to do afterwards so that the child and the family can picture that this isn't going to last forever, that there will be a done part at the end. That's really good. I think um, as I'm listening to you share what to do before, during, and after. I'm also thinking of, there are so many tools that I watched our child life specialists use, um, depending upon the severity of what it, what it was that we were going through, um, who happened to be in the room, whether we had other kids in there, which siblings add a whole new dimension to child life specialists, because then not only do you have to work with the parents and the child, but also the siblings that are in there. Um And also just knowing that y'all had so many resources. I know some of that depends on the hospital where a nurse may be working. Um, Katie, if you had to, if you had to say like maybe your top three tools that you have as a child life specialist, what are your, what are your three that you think, I don't know whether, I don't want to say your favorites, but what do you think of the three that really stand out to you as like, yeah, that particular strategy or that particular tool that we have, it's so good. I'm so glad that we have it. Yeah. Oh, so, so many to choose from. Um, the first is using parents in any capacity, whether it's a resource of information, um, engaging in the procedure. Uh, we have a comfort position handbook, which teaches parents and clinicians exactly how to implement what's called comfort positioning. And it keeps um, kids from having to be held down on their back during procedures. Um, so I would say parents as a resource and parents as comfort positioning if they're willing p- to participants and want to engage in it. Um, the second thing is I really do love like a well-placed diversion or distraction when, um, you know, I've taken kids back to the operating room before they're falling asleep with their anesthesia mask and they're playing this like little bubble game on the iPad. And we're just like writing this like little bubble popping game and they just fall back to sleep. And it's such a beautiful marriage between play and getting done what's medically necessary. And the child is entertained and falls asleep beautifully. Um, that's, probably my second thing. And I would say third thing is, um, I love a good drug that takes pain away. Um, I mean, if it's LMX, Emla, Freezy Spray, you know, if the child has a choice to have that, that's my, my third favorite tool in the toolbox. I think, I think I might agree with you on that third one. Um, (laughs) it's funny that you, you talk about the diversion part. The thing that finally got our son to manage his blood draws was the game flow. It was on the iPad. And, it, and I thought when, when child life brought that in, I thought that, I mean, great. Now we have another game that I need to like download yes. on my phone. But at the same time, I was like, I was super skeptical. I was like, I mean, listen, I've been around a bunch of kids and I know you're a child life specialist, but this is not going to work. Yes. And I'll be darned if, as soon as, as soon as he pulled it up and he took a deep breath and he did his first blood draw without just, it was horrible. And, and when he did that, it was like a little poke and you saw him and we both like the child life specialist and I both looked at each other and we're like, that's what it took. Like, it was almost like this big epiphany for both of us. But I think you're right. Like, I think we, 
and, and it wasn't that we were lying. He knew what was happening. Absolutely. He knew what we were doing, but it was sort of like, hey, this thing is going to happen. And, you know, yes, your arm is attached to you, but you can also do this other thing. And I never dreamed that a game on the iPad would be the diversion because I was thinking bigger, like we need to do the numbing cream or the Versed or like this whole, like this whole rigmarole. And as it turned out, that was the thing that worked for him. So right. I'm really glad that you mentioned that because sometimes I think it has to be big or it has to be this this orchestrated thing. And sometimes if you just go simple, that might be the one thing that they need for you to oh. not blow up a big hullabaloo and just do the one small thing to get them to to manage whatever they're trying to get through. Yeah. And I think that's why we can be perceived sometimes as the play lady, because often play is the thing that works. It's often us like but catching kids. bubbles. Of course yeah. it works. <laughs> it's push button books. It's uh, playing iPad. It's getting a gaming system in there during an infusion. It's play is really kind of at the base of everything we do. Um, and that's such a good testament to why. Because he was playing. No. He was. And and I think that you're right. I mean, I think that's really why I wanted you here on the podcast is because y'all aren't just the people who have all the toys and all the gizmos and all the really fun stuff. Yes, you do have all those things, but there's meaning behind of all, all of that. And there's a purpose and there's an intention to it. And I think when we can incorporate that into either a NICU, PICU, or a different hospital stay setting, it really can improve not just that particular stay, but it can improve when they come back to the hospital that they're not walking back into trauma, but that they're walking back into a place that they know may or may not be uncomfortable, but they know that they can get through it because we had the tools available to them. So I think that in many ways, y'all are helping reduce the trauma that families and kids feel in a really hard place. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of child loss well, specialists. Thank you for saying that. Honestly, it, it- I never get tired of when families like you have an experience that they share and they talk about child life. We try really hard to bring awareness and advocacy to our profession. And so having you recognize child life and to be on this podcast and talk to other nurses means so much to us. And we are just, we love being a part of the care team and it's in our bones, it's in our DNA. So thank you for having me and talking about child life and spreading awareness. No, it shows. I'm super glad mm-hmm. that you were here. So if y'all want to hear more um, about how you can be a better nurse, a better NICU professional, we have more podcasts coming. But thank you so much, Katie, for being here today. Thanks, y'all, for listening to NICU Heroes. If you enjoyed today's episode, please don't be shy, y'all. You can share it, you can subscribe, and you can most certainly review it. We would love your reviews. It's how we reach more NICU professionals. I'll see y'all next time.